morning. Christos Anasti. Today I'd like to discuss the Orthodox family in a changing world. Picture, if you will, in the middle of a calm and tranquil pond, a sizable pebble fell one day. A short column of water lifted itself up and then, and then fell back into the pond and started a series of concentric circles which kept on growing and growing and growing even to the present day. This is how the attack began against the first human family in its heavenly abode. And it goes on unabated, unrelenting ever since. Because the first attack took place in heaven and the shadow of the throne of God it should come as a warning to us that no family, no family, none of us is immune from attack, no matter where it may begin or where it may happen to find itself or the conditions under which it lives. And what was the goal? <clears throat> And what was the goal of the original, most devastating attack that took place? To tear the family, to loosen it from its divine beliefs, its principles, its values, and set it adrift on the road of selfish and an arrogant abandonment of disciplines, of dignity, of self-respect under the misconceived license of freedom. From the dawn of recorded history and through great periods of learning and eminent civilization, the family failed to even remotely approach that harmony and mission and purpose and unity which it possessed before the fall. Only the appearance of Christ brought a halt to this disintegration of the family structure and it offered not only the promise but the ingredients necessary to restore it to its former dignity and grandeur. The family in the times preceding and immediately following the coming of the Lord was heathen in belief and mostly Greek and Roman and ethnicity. If we limit ourselves to the area, we know best. For example, Europe and the Middle East. The bond of the family, as we Christians know it today, never did exist during the times of the great philosophers. The state was the highest object in life. Aristotle explains, that the organized body of free citizens comes before the family and the individual man is nothing more than a political animal. Just imagine you were considered nothing in the times of Aristotle, but rather you were considered something. You were considered an animal. Socrates, in instructing his son on marriage, tells him that such wives 
are selected as expected to yield beautiful soul, beautiful children. Women were thus reduced to the level of slaves with no will of their own and no higher virtue than bearing children. So Aristotle has us as animals and Socrates had women as childbearing. The Greeks and the Romans and all the heathens practice an absolute authority over their children, extending to life and death. When a father considered the life of his child useless or believed that the child was not made perfect, and that he wasn't a perfect specimen of manhood, and he would thus be unable to contribute to the grandeur and the glory of the state, the father would cast it off a mountain into the river below. Something, if you remember the movie 300, the Spartans, and how the Spartans would kill the weakest child. And the Romans also practiced this, where they would take the weakest male child and throw it off the cliffs into the river or into the ravine down below. Even among the Hebrews, only the people who believed in the true God in a society where supremacy of the male prevailed, the woman did not fare much better among others. And this chaos of moral Degradation, we'll say, and mere legal existence of the family came Christianity, and they came to inject a moral and an ethical view of what the true family should be. They recognized chastity as a greater virtue than wisdom, bravery and courage. It inspired both men and women with a sense of honor which would not abandon even in the face of death. The few women of antiquity, such as Penelope, Nafsica, Andromaca, Antigone, who lived in honor and virtue as an ex. As ex Fiction. As, a, as an exception to their society, now became in the Christian milieu, milieu the general rule. The sad attitude of respect and honor for the individual brought about the emancipation of the woman. It, ele it elevated her to complete equality with the man. And it recognized her rights and dignity as the mother of humanity. Now you have man and woman that are equal. Marriage now became not a contract for an improvement of relations between the states or the whole of the production of beautiful children, but a sacred union of the body and soul for the propagation of society and the glory of the kingdom of God, the restraint from the passions, the exercise of virtue and the promotion of joy and happiness. From the very beginning, marriage was closed with a sacramental character on the basis of the Apostle Paul's comparison of the union between man and woman, woman 
with the union of Christ and his church. St. Clement of Alexandria gives us this lucid description of the family and the relation which should exist between its members. He writes, the mother is the glory of the children. The wife is the glory of the husband. Both are the glory of the wife. And God is the glory of all of them together. The heathen practice of child destruction was also now eliminated. An accomplishment of the Christian fathers and the Christian councils, which finally wrote this into law by the Emperor Constantine the Great in 315 AD. Prayer and fasting were two forms of discipline without which the family could not exist. Prayer has always been considered by the Christian as the bulwark of faith and the weapon against all the enemies of the soul. It's what we preach every week. Without prayer, there is nothing but darkness and utter madness. Prayer, says Tertullian, blots out our sins. It repels temptation, quenches persecution, comforts the despondent, blesses the high-minded, and guides the wanderer. He goes on to write that it calms the billows, it feeds the poor, it directs the rich, holds up the falling, raises the fallen, and preserves those who stand. Now fasting was also a practice of the Jews which continued by, which was continued by the Christians. Fasting was also given to us by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as a great example, as a great example for us all to follow. It was always connected with prayer so that the mind unobstructed by earthly cares might devote itself with less distraction to the contemplation of things divine. Both of these disciplines effectively practiced, led and still lead to the regular and worthy partaking of the Eucharist, which was, is, and will ever remain the heart and center of our Orthodox worship. But the respite and support that the early Christianity brought to the family has not rendered the family safe from attack and immune from the trials and tribulations. In our own lifetime, there was a time when social service instruments, such as the public schools, public agencies, even the government, were the main builders and supporters of the family. Not so anymore. The family now finds itself not only isolated, but violated and attacked by the very agencies which were supposed to defend it. Through legislation which permits, even encourages, abortion, divorce, 
the legislation which not only protects the human rights of the individual as well as it should, but legitimizes and promotes the unethical and immoral and sinful activities and the very fiber of the family. Even the strongest Christian family is severely threatened today. And what does this mean to us? What must we do as Orthodox Christians when we are under attack? We must accept in all seriousness the fact that the burden for the preservation of the family has fallen on the family itself. But the family cannot do it by itself. And just as in war, the best form of defense is attack, so must the family go on the attack by putting Christ in the family circle. Without Christ in our center, we have no support. Why is it our children are under attack if they take the day off on Good Friday to attend the church services? Why is it that our children have to, along with their parents, go to the local high school or this local school district and see if their prom can be changed from Good Friday evening. Why is it that it's no longer Christmas but a winter holiday? The family, the Christian family, is always under attack now. Is there an oil lamp or a wax votive light or even an electric lantern mystically flickering in front of the most, in most icons within our homes? Is the Bible the most used book in our home? Or is it on the shelf collecting dust? Or is it the, the gift that the priest gives us when we get married and we just place it in the drawer? Is your home today a haven for toil and trouble where the Spirit of Christ prevails in happiness, peace, and tranquility? Or is it an unseen battleground where a running battle of infective and swearing and anger and accusation, nagging and arguments is constantly going on between the husband and the wife and the wife and the children or the husband and the ch children and various other combinations? What kind of conversation do we indulge in? before our meals, after our meals. What is our conversation when we have company, when we're at work, or when we're relaxing with just friends? How much of it pertains to the discussion of attainment, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Christian goals and how much do we sit around and start listening to jokes and useless nonsense or the gossip of the latest thing that's going around? How much do the constructive thinking and concern about our government, our schools, our churches, our businesses, the media, the clubs, organizations, and the likes, and how much to the vicious criticisms of leaders, teachers, clergy, parents, our peers, and others. How much 
to the perpetuation and the propagation of the truth and how much still to the gossip. How much is mimicking others and their ways and how much is wholesome personal conviction. If we permit ourselves to be molded by our environment, if we permit ourselves to be absorbed by movements around us, if we permit our values, our principles, to be watered down by pressured groups, if we permit the divine eternal and unchanging truths of our Orthodox Christian faith to be changed and to be supplanted by the world around us of the times. We are nothing short of foolish captains, so to say, who venture to sail their ships through the oceans without a compass, without a map, without any direction whatsoever, or getting into a car and just driving and not knowing where we're going. If the home does not reflect the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control it is not a Christian home it cannot be a dwelling of a Christian family nor should we forget that Christianity is not a negative passive or even neutral way of life but a positive active in a life that is involved with living with Christ as our true example. And what is it then? What makes a home, a family, truly Christian? High goals and aspirations Godly aims and ambitions, gracious and considerate family relations, a place where, where Christ is really and truly in the middle of this family circle, and the family truly reflects it outside the home with others. And when we do this, we spread the love we have with Christ in our heart, with that burning desire in our Christian home, and we spread it out to other families. It starts with one family, and it grows and grows just as that pebble is thrown into the pond and that wave gets larger and larger, so does this pond of Christian love, the Christian family. We will find so many homes and such homes and families that will bounce against <clears throat> one another and the homes will grow into larger and larger and they would never reverse their course and they would stay the course and the ship and the captain who's out on sea will have his map and his compass because now he is Christ to guide them. 
And this is what we need in our homes today to bring Christ back into the home, to have him as our focal point. So this way, all of us, you, me, our neighbors, will be blessed with this original tranquility for all humanity to see that we will live as Christ wanted us to live as the first family should have lived in paradise but now we are to live as our Lord's family with love, patience, and humility, but most of all, with repentance in our heart for our fellow man, with love for our brothers and sisters, with the equality of a husband and wife, where the two are equal, and no one is above one another in this marriage when the two become one where our children are taught how to live a life in Christ where we can stand up to our legislation to the schools and let them know that Christ comes first in our lives you know, there's a great book that was written by a football player. It says, I am third. And what does he mean by I am third? First came Christ and God in his life. Second was his family and his friends and everybody else. And then finally, he came third. He was the last person on the chain. And that's how we should approach our lives. God is number one. Our family, relatives as number two, and we as number three. And with this, our pond of all humanity will be one of love. May God bless you, keep you safe above all. Amen.